Hello fellow birders, my name is Dennis Kania. Today we're going to be taking a look at the owls that can be found in DuPage County. On the DuPage Birding Club Education Channel, we'll be discussing all things bird related. And as I mentioned, today we'll be taking a look at the owls that can be found in DuPage County. Here are the breeding birds, uh, or the breeding owls that we can find in the county. We have great horned owl, eastern screech owl, and barred owl, all of which regularly occur as breeders in the county. And we'll talk in more detail about each of those. Some of our winter visitors that come in um, in the winter time would be short-eared owl, long-eared owl, northern saw-wet owl, and snowy owl on rare occasions. So here are some graphs that show the occurrence of these owls um, from our Fermilab data that's been collected over the last 33 years. And you can see for these top three owls, they are found throughout the entire year and they are all breeders in the county. Uh, the most frequently seen owl would be the great horned owl. And you can see that we've always had very good luck in filling in the records for, for that species. Uh, we're in the midst of our um, current survey period, so we expect that we should fill in most of these blocks here. Uh, Eastern screech owl um, also occurs as a breeder in, um, at Fermilab. And you can see that in the winter time and early spring, uh, we do find um, records of those birds. Uh, it's much more difficult to find them during the, uh, the summer months and we don't try very hard in that season to, to locate them. Barred owls um, were only starting to appear at Fermilab uh, starting in the 2012 to 2016 um, survey period with any regularity. Uh, the very first record came from the survey period just before that which was uh, we would have seen that first bird in 2011. It was on a Christmas count. And so that's represented by this green square here. Uh, Long-eared owl has always been a species that is regularly found at Fermilab in the wintertime. They come in in the beginning to mid-December and are usually with us through the winter months and departing by the end of March. Very rarely in the long past, we used to have them going into April. They're becoming harder and harder to find. Um, there's a couple reasons for this. One of the well-known um, roost sites for uh, this species was in a public area and they received very, very much pressure in that area. And so those birds are no, no longer utilizing that, that particular roost site. Also, there's been a change, I think, in the prey species and uh, with the increased number of coyotes that we have, that's had a severe impact on on the meadow bowls, which is a primary uh, food source for the long-eared owls. Short-eared owls have been a little bit more resilient, um, partly because uh, it's hard to track them down. So, you know, people probably aren't impacting those anywhere near as much. And you can see again that they are coming in uh, maybe a little bit earlier than the long-eared owls. I have seen them in October, uh, but they are around in November, December, all the way through the winter months. And by March, uh, they again are departing. So now we'll take a closer look at some of our owl species and we'll start off with a great horned owl. And technically this is a nocturnal owl, but this is, this is the owl that you're most likely going to see in the daytime. Uh, they can be a little more active, uh, particularly if they're uh, feeding young, they might be feeding more even during the daytime. It's a very widespread owl and we actually find it throughout the Western Hemisphere. So the, this owl is represented all the way up into Alaska and all the way down to the southern tip of South America and almost all points in between. It does like woodlands uh, primarily as a uh, nesting habitat. However, um, they can be a bit adaptable depending on where they are in their range. Uh, and they have it actually been found to nest on the ground on occasion. And speaking of nesting, uh, the great horned owl does not make its own nest. It will actually grab a nest of another bird species or it might use a squirrel nest. And in some cases it'll nest where there is no nest at all. I've seen them um, lay their eggs just in the crotch of a tree uh, where there's um, enough of a shelf that they can uh, 
you know, secure those eggs on that shelf. Uh, they'll also use artificial uh, nest platforms. Uh, so, so they're very adaptable. We had an, an occasion one time, uh, speaking of them, you know, grabbing other birds' nests, they do start their, their um, search for a nest very early before any other birds are back um, because they do start breeding very, very early, uh, uh, nesting usually by January or February. So we had an occurrence out at Fermilab where there was an oak savanna that had two large nests in it, and they were both built by red-tailed hawks. And since the great horned owl gets there uh, first uh, to breed before the, a couple of months before the red-tailed hawks, they will select the best looking nest out of the two. Then the red-tailed hawk comes along and it'll refurbish the nest that's maybe a little more dilapidated. So by the next year, that's gonna look like better nests. And so when the great horned owl arrives and he checks out the two nests, he's going to take that better nest again, leaving the other nest to the great um, red-tailed hawk, which will then again fix that nest up. And you know we end up seeing this flip-flop back and forth year after year. And this went on for oh, maybe five years or so. And who knows how long it was going on before we noticed that, that it was occurring. So it's actually kind of a funny thing to see that going on. But they do begin their courtship very early. You'll hear them calling quite a bit in December. And again, as I mentioned, um, they're already nesting by January or even you know, maybe as late as February. On rare occasions, they'll go later than that, especially if they have a failure of first attempt. But their offspring will hatch then pretty early in the year. Um, and they're actually usually fledging by April or early May. And their diet includes mammals such as rabbits, squirrels, and small rodents, as well as birds and reptiles. Uh, as far as identification characteristics, you would look for those ear tufts. You can see those are pretty widely spread apart on this bird, um, and they're well-developed ear tufts. You can see that the facial pattern is, has so much a round face that it's kind of orangish in color, but has a very good, strong, dark surrounding edge to it. And you'll notice this white throat patch. That's very significant for identifying this owl. Our next species that we want to talk about is barred owl. Again, a, a nocturnal owl. It's on the increase in our county. Uh, we seem to be finding them in more and more woodlots. It is a cavity nester, even though it's a large owl. So it is going to be looking for rather mature for, uh, woodlands in order to nest. It's going to need large trees so that it can find large enough nest uh, cavities. And uh, they do like wet uh, woodlands, so you're more likely to find them in some of our forest preserves that are along main water courses. They do begin their courtship roughly the same time as uh, the great horned owls, maybe slightly later than that. And they'll lay their eggs anywhere from late February into May, um, more likely to be in the early part of that window. And their diet also includes small mammals as well as birds, amphibians, and reptiles. So barred owls, uh, as far as identification purposes, you'll see that they are rather round headed and it's, it looks like a large head. There are no ear tufts at all and they do have a dark eye as opposed to a yellow eye. All of our other owls that occur in the county will have yellow eyes. And you can see it has this very noticeable and recognizable streaking on the, uh, on the breast of the bird. Here's uh, Eastern Screech Owl, another one of our uh, breeding species, and again, also nocturnal. And their populations seem to be decreasing in the county. We're having a much harder time locating them at Fermilab, and I've talked to other people that are maybe doing some owling outside of Fermilab, and, and they're running into the same issue. And there's probably a couple reasons for this. Uh, one of them is that they're being preyed upon by uh, barred owls, which are increasing in the county. In fact, the way that we got our first barred owl at Fermilab on that Christmas count back in 2011 was we were in the middle of night playing uh, tapes in order to attract a screech owl so that we could, you know, check them off for the count. And um, all of a sudden, a large owl flew in 
and just in silhouette, it looked quite different. We, we were expecting it would be a, a great horned owl, but it just didn't look right. So we put a spotlight on it, and sure enough, it ended up being a barred owl. So we knew that once the barred owl was there, we weren't going to have any luck in that woodlot. So we actually moved over to the next woodlot and started playing our screech owl tape. And once again, the barred owl was in there instantly. So it's quite obvious that the barred owls are preying on, uh, on screech owls. The other thing uh, that um, might be impacting them is West Nile virus. Um, we haven't had as dramatic occurrences of uh, West Nile virus in the county. Um, in a while now, if not if anywhere near as bad as our, our initial hit when uh, when the crows really got wiped out and uh, chickadees and blue jays also suffered to some extent. So we're thinking that um, West Nile virus may be impacting the, the screech owls. Uh, we don't have any firm data on that, but that, that is uh, something that's been suggested to us. So in picking out woodlots that they will nest in, they're looking again for uh, woodlots that have a lot of mature trees so that they have those nest cavities. But they're also going to be trying to find woodlots that do not have some of the larger owls like great horned owl or barred owl um, populating those woodlots. They do come in two different color forms, uh, one of them being gray, one very gray and the other one being very reddish or rufous. And so we have examples of both of those. Here's the gray one and here's a, a rufous one. And they do start their courtship uh, a little later than the uh, larger owls, so maybe by a couple of months later. And they'll lay their eggs anywhere from late March into early May. Their diet includes small rodents, such as and birds, amphibians, reptiles, insects, and even crustaceans. And they do like uh, to use um, even artificial nest cavities. So if you do put up an, an owl box, that you have a good chance uh, of getting a screech owl. My son and I did a little science project quite a few years ago, and we um, were collecting owl pellets. We did find some owl pellets that uh, belonged to a screech owl, and I collected them in, in February, actually. And when we uh, dissected those pellets, we actually found uh, bits of shell covering uh, ectoskeleton of uh, crayfish. Uh, that was quite surprising to us, especially considering the timing of the year. I mean, they were relatively fresh pellets um, and collected in February. So somehow uh, these screech owls are locating crustaceans in the middle of the night. Um, I can't imagine how much noise they're possibly making, but somehow the, the screech owls are finding them and actually preying upon them. You'll notice um, just for a few um, ID characteristics here. They do have ear tufts, which you can see here. And uh, I'm going to go back one slide. So you can see the ear tufts more dramatically there. They're not really big ear tufts, but I guess the right size for that size bird. And they do have a lot of fine barring on the uh, underparts. You can see that on these juvenile birds as well. So those are characteristics that you would look for for a screech owl. And it's a very small owl compared to the other two we've just talked about. So now we'll get into some of our winter visitors, uh, short-eared owl. Um, in the past has nested in DuPage County um, at Springbrook, but that hasn't happened in quite a long time. And so they're now considered a winter visitor. And they're primarily nocturnal. However, they are also crepuscular, which means that you'll see them quite active at dawn and dusk. So they like to hunt over extensive open fields and a couple of good places that you can look for them would be uh, Fermilab, the open grassland areas along Eola Road or at Springbrook, that's another good site. So their diet during the winter is primarily small rodents. And uh, as their name suggests, their ear tufts are very, very short and hardly noticeable. You can just see them as little bumps on the top of the head here. So not very noticeable at all. Uh, their underparts are, are actually quite pale as you get towards the belly. They're darker here on the breast, upper breast, but then as you get down further, they, they are quite, uh, quite pale. And that's a differing uh, feature from what you'd see on long-eared owls, which would be dark all the way through. Uh, their flight uh, is somewhat moth-like. They just look like they're floating on the air when they're hunting, and they'll do sharp cartwheels uh, when they want to turn quickly uh, in, when they're hunting prey. So quite noticeable just, just by the, um, their 
um, flight patterns. So here's the long-eared owl, and again, a winter visitor. They are nocturnal, but they're a communally roosting species. And what that means is that um, once you find, you seldom find one long-eared owl roosting by itself. Typically, they'll be roosting in groups. And at Fermilab, there were times when we would find long-eared owls uh, roosting in numbers uh, approaching 20 in the, in the flock. So um, very, very interesting to find that. And uh, they do prefer thickets or, or conifers for roosting. And they're very, very loyal to those uh, day roosts. So uh, once they're located and once word gets out uh, on where to find them, uh, there'll be a lot of impact or pressure on, the, uh, on, the, on this species. So um, most people really don't talk about where they, where they find their long-eared owls anymore, you know, partly because of that. And their diet in winter is primarily small rodents, but they do also um, collect small birds. Uh, my son and I, again, with that science project, we collected 100 long-eared owl pellets, which was quite easy because back in the day, um, because they are communally roosting, and you have, even if it's just a half a dozen long-eared owls in that roost site, um, 100 pellets are accumulated quite quickly. So we took 100 pellets and we dissected all of those, and it turned out that there were uh, four different uh, species or groups of uh, uh, prey species in, in that mix, and 94% of the uh, of their food source came from meadow voles, and then 2% was white-footed deer mice, 2% were shrew species, and another 2% were some kind of small finch-like bills, uh, billed birds. So I'm guessing something like juncos, maybe uh, tree sparrows, or something like that. So on a long-eared owl, you can see ear tufts, but they're set much closer together. This looks kind of wide here, but if you, this is more representative. If you see, look here, you can see just how close these two ear tufts are to each other uh, on the forehead here. Same in this example as well. So much closer together than what you would expect on great horned owl. Now they do have that orangish facial disc again. It's not outlined as strongly. And here this bird is facing us, and you can see that there's an absence of that white patch on the throat. So that would be long-eared owl. Here's another one of our uh, wintering visitors. This is northern sawwet owl, again nocturnal, and they are extremely loyal to their day roosts. They're, they're not communally roosting. However, if you can find uh, where they are roosting, they'll come back to that same site day after day after day. Uh, they're often found in conifers. And their diet uh, in the winter is primarily with small rodents, small birds, and again, crustaceans. And I know of someone that also was doing some owl di pellet dissecting, and they, they also found uh, bits and pieces of crayfish in, uh, in some owl pellets that were coming from the sawwet owl. Uh, they can be quite approachable on their day roosts, and that makes them very, very vulnerable uh, to repeated interruptions. So uh, it's, it's really hard for us to think that um, you know, our little visit to, to see an owl is going to have much impact. But when you compound that by many, many people visiting that same owl once the word gets out, and especially in the case of a northern sawwet owl where they're very loyal to their um, roost site, it's easy for people to find them. And some people can be a little overzealous in, in trying to get, you know, photographs and things like that. So uh, it can create quite a problem for them because they're just, you know, uh, they have only so much time to sleep, they have only so much time to hunt. And if you're interrupting that cycle at all, you're impacting, you know, how much energy they can store and then how much they're actually consuming um, with the interruptions. We can go home to a nice warm house in the middle of the winter. Uh, they don't have that luxury. We can go home and find a meal served on our table every night and they're not guaranteed that like we are. Snowy owls uh, do occur in the county. There are a few records. Um, they are a winter visitor, once again. They are nocturnal. However, they tend to find roost sites that are out just on open fields. And so you can see them in the middle of the day. It's not that hard to find them in the daytime if they're around. We just don't have very many occurrences in our county. You have to go maybe to the lakefront of Chicago to find them or go further west uh, to where some of the larger expansive open farm fields are and their diet in the winter is primarily small rodents. 
the birds that we would expect to see would not be all snowy white. Uh, I'm sure you've seen pictures of snowy owls that look like that, but the ones that we're going to see are going to be um, speckled with all these little you know, charcoal gray markings all over them. And the reason for that is most of the birds that we're seeing are birds that cannot establish a territory uh, up in the tundra, and so they have to come down here. And we have um, snowy owls showing up in what are considered to be invasion years, meaning that uh, for some reason, and that's generally because of uh, food sources, they'll be forced to, to move out of their normal territories or out of their normal range and they, they come further south. So that's when we start to see them down here. And the birds that are uh, the stronger birds, the adult birds, they're going to be able to hang on to territories where there is food, even though that, um, that food source might be dwindling. The younger birds cannot hold a territory and so they're forced to come down here. So most of the birds that we will see will look like this. So I'd just like to touch for a minute on birding Essex and owls, uh, since it is kind of a touchy subject. Um, owls are a very special target for birders and photographers, and so um, a lot of pressure is put upon them. But keep in mind that their survival depends on that delicate balance between energy storage and expenditure. Uh, that's something I just talked about with the sawwood owl. Uh, when we interrupt that, um, we're, we're having a definite impact on on those uh, on those birds, and think about that exposure day after day after day. You know, if you have an owl like a sawwood owl that is very loyal to its day roost, that means everybody's going to find that owl day after day after day, and all those continuous interruptions are going to have an impact on their on their uh, life cycle. So the same thing can be said um, in regards to utilizing uh, recordings in order to bring owls into view. And I've, I've heard many stories about this and I've, I've witnessed it on, on a few occasions where people will be you know, blasting screech owl tapes in order to get a screech owl to come out of a, a roost hole. And that's, you know, that's just, that's something we shouldn't be doing. We should know better than that. Um, all of our birds are under so much pressure now uh, that just keeps increasing year after year. And, uh, we as birders shouldn't be applying even further pressure on them. You know, the other pressure is coming because of loss of habitat and other environmental issues. And we're just adding to the problem if we're um, harassing them. And the final thing that I'd like to mention is that I, I have witnessed this as well, is um, where short-eared owls are uh, hunting, they'll also roost in those same fields during the daytime. And there's no way that anybody should be entering any of those fields in that winter to, uh, during that winter season to try and find the short-eared owls. All it requires is staying on the road, um, using a little bit of patience and waiting for them to come out at, at dusk. Uh, you should not be trying to force them out by going and walking in the fields and thinking that you can possibly get closer. All you're going to do is chase them out and then no one's gonna be seeing any owls. So thanks for taking the time to view this video. Uh, hopefully we've given you some bird food for thought and I hope you'll join us again in the future as we explore all things bird related.